All right, Michael McCaffrey, you are the founder and partner of ADA Sure. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. So, uh, Michael, tell me, so ADA Sure, can you kind of explain what it is that you do? Because I think this is going to open up a number of questions <laughs> I think a lot of people have. And I'm so glad that you're on the show to be able to help answer uh, these questions. Sure. It really, just very briefly, what we do is we make the internet accessible to disabled users. So mm. websites, apps, you know, we make it so that a blind user is able to have the same experience as um, anyone else. So that's really the heart of what we do. Sure. So aside from wanting to make sure that we, you know, a, a website is accessible to the, the greatest number of people, certainly someone that might be used to like, oh, great, here's another website that's it's like not easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, are there laws? Uh, there are, I mean, obviously, there are laws that are designed uh, to, uh, to, to make using a business's website accessible. Right. And, and can you kind of explain, I mean, in your non, I know you're not an attorney, but yeah. <laughs> explain what the law is essentially. Sure. It's really the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was enacted in 1990. Really 1998 is when it was updated to start to include digital properties. That's when websites were starting to, you know, um, come about. So 98 is really when we, we have these rules called the WCAG, the Web Content and Accessibility Guidelines. That's what the ADA uses to determine if this website's accessible or not. Um, so you, what, when you're building a website, the, the idea is that if you adhere to these WCAG guidelines, then you're pretty assured that any kind of assistive technology that a blind person or a hearing impaired person may use, you're gonna be operable with that. So that's really the heart of it. The ADA um, calls out the WCAG guidelines. Um, and that's what we're supposed so to do. So what use. happens What happens if a large company is not following those guidelines? Sure. So what, what, what really is what sticks out is the issue. So like, let's say like a, a, if there's a large pizza company, right? And they have an app and most people are ordering pizzas through an app and their website. And let's say, for example, that there's coupons that are only available. You know, you log in, create an account and you have special coupons. The, really the heart of the ADA looks at that different and inferior uh, experience for that user, right? So if that person uh, is not able to get those coupons, they're not able to access those coupons because it's not accessible, that is when we start seeing litigation come out because you, know, you have a, a disabled class of users who suddenly have to pay more for the same pizza just because the website's not accessible. So, okay, so this applies to large companies. How about medium and small companies. <laughs> it, there, and so that's good. There are, there are specifics in there. It's companies have to have a minimum of five people. Um, so this isn't really, you know, it's not so much targeted at mom and pop shops. They're looking at, is it um, a retailer? Is there, are you, is it an e-commerce site um, where there are special offers and purchases that really one class of people cannot use? Um, but a local, store uh, that just has um, information on location and hours. Um, you know, that's, that's really at the heart of the litigation. It's more kind of the, the larger and e-commerce sites. So how do we know what that level is? Of, of um, the accessibility? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I, mean, I, I want to know like, okay, so my company's, you know, we're doing seven figures now. Uh, is that, you know, is it number of employees? Is it number of customers? Is it, you know, footprint within a certain geography? Sure. The exemption I heard was if it's less than five people, it's exempt. So, um, you know, small uh, company just getting started, less than five people. That's the only one that I'm aware of that exempts um, a user. Um, from having an accessible website. Ideally, everyone's site is accessible. Um, but when you see a lot of the litigation that's happening now, it is um, really focused on the e-commerce sites. And again, it's a federal law. So anywhere in the U.S. is applicable. Um, and it's wow. really kind of that site where if a disabled user is going to have a different experience and it's going to cause them to pay more or not be able to you know, order something, that's really what this litigation is about right now. And what is the likelihood that, 
that that a business might, you know, get complaints, uh, you know, be potentially uh, subject to litigation. I mean, I, it, help me play the odds here, because I think a lot of people might be thinking, okay, look, we'll address it if we get a complaint, but for right now, we have so many other things that we're worried about. Yeah, I, I can understand that, sure. So um, really, the people who are at risk, um, when, you, when you, have, um, you have a website and you also have a physical location, this is one mm -hmm. that we're seeing the largest spike because um, with really the, the, there's something called the nexus. So if um, a disabled person would have to go into that store to make the same purchase that anyone else can make online, that's a huge yeah. red flag right there. Mm -hmm. um, so that nexus of tying into uh, it's a, a website plus a physical location, they're, they're really, that's what the ADA is um, really focused on. Um, but a small brochure website, kind of informational website, obviously should still be accessible. That's yeah. not really where the litigation is coming into right now. And it's, and it's interesting because as the court is setting the precedence now, it's, it's in a way, it's kind of growing and evolving. So um, it's kind of an interesting time. And so, um, are there, uh, I mean, are there organizations, are there uh, predatory litigators out there? Are there, are there uh, people that are specifically going out to try to sh shake down businesses <laughs> it actually, uh, because they might not be compliant? Yeah, I mean, of course, there is, there's going to be that. And I think you see that in kind of any, any industry where there's um, some type of opportunity. You saw that just with the ADA facilities, you know, back in the 90s with the yeah. you know, companies that maybe a parking spot or it wasn't met, uh, didn't meet code or uh, a website, mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, a, website, a bathroom wasn't up to specification. So right. um, you, you do you do see that. But then there's also there are vigilant um, organizations, the National Foundation for the Blind. Um, mm -hmm. And there are, there's, you know, um, groups of people who are literally, you know, focused on how do we get the word out, build awareness so that this this law is um, you know people adhere to it. You have kind of the the Food and Drug Administration, for example. There is an enforcement arm out there that is making sure companies comply with the regulations. That's absent from the ADA. There isn't a government enforcement body that's going after these companies. So you do have organizations that are doing it for the good will, you know, and to and to make these websites and apps accessible. And it's not sort of that surf by lawsuits. It's actually you know, how do we change perception and make this so it's a common practice if people build accessible websites from the start? Yeah, yeah. So what do you think the, I mean, you know, granted, like we, we do want to, I think most business owners obviously would, would probably feel badly if, if someone who is visually impaired came to their website and it was a horrible experience. I think that the, you know, most of us would be like, oh, well, shoot, I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, what what do you think the you know kind of the the minimum everybody should do um, would be? Are there any best practices there? Absolutely, and that's a, the WCAG guidelines. Um, there's a, definitely a, a misunderstanding that a, a lot of this is just simple foundational practices. So a, a really a, a good example is a, a website that may be. Uh, it could be, you know, let's say it's a college or it is um, any type of entity that's making, you know, there's sales and maybe they have a promotion. Maybe, you know, there's a, um, a registration fee for a college is waived in, during a certain semester or there is a, a company that's having a special offer. Really yeah. that ad that's being built, it's literally one extra line of code that's been available. It should be, you know, all you have to do is update that so it can explain the offer very briefly to someone with a screen reader. So it's not really implementing new technology. It's using what's already out there. Um, it's just kind of that awareness of, you know what, when we do have an ad and we put the ad on our website, we have to add a description to it so that everyone can hear it. Um, so it's basic design principles. It's just kind of that awareness and understanding where if you aren't aware of that, you're not even going to realize you need to include that. So. And Michael, who are, who are your clients and what is the problem that you solve for them? Sure. So companies come to us um, to, to kind of most, mostly it's e-commerce companies. We have um, some colleges, uh, retailers, um, uh, hotels, uh, and it's really those companies that have um, it's a location somewhere. They have a physical presence and they have the website and they have that disjointed experience. So 
Um, we are finding two types of people. One, it's being people who are proactive. They're, they've heard about this. They want to obviously avoid any bad press and litigation, and they want to do the right thing and yeah. make the site successful. So you have the proactive companies, and then unfortunately you have companies who have maybe received a demand letter or a lawsuit. So they'll reach out to us too and say, you know, we got this, we don't know what to do, how do we get started? And that's really where we can offer the value to say, you know, we can look at their website, find all the barriers, and then literally, you know, we have tools and software to show them how to fix it so they can do it on their own. Mm. And then monitor it once they are accessible to remain accessible going forward too. And, and I see on your website, you offer free audits or free report. Mm -hmm. um, so who would be a good candidate for that free report? Sure. Yeah. Well, this, this free report, it's really any, any company out there who is not certain. If you have any doubt, uh, you know, maybe there you've heard of accessibility. You think one of the developers on your team or the agency you hired, you think there was some accessibility clause or something. You know, there's any doubt, I would say, come in do the free report. We basically scan uh, the top, we do a hundred pages of your website um, and then put together a report. It's usually about five pages long or so. And it really just details, you know, hey, this is roughly how compliant you are. Here's some of the major errors yeah. that we're seeing so you can understand kind of what some of the barriers are. Um, and it's a good starting point, you know, um, to see it kind of erases that doubt. You either are accessible or you're not. And um, if you're not, then we can work with you to get you a plan so you become accessible. Right. And so once a client then Josh, I think I lost you there. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, Michael, yeah, we're back. <laughs> okay. Um, so, does a website then, um, so your service is then, like, you could become their ADA compliance department, and then they just keep you, uh, keep a relationship with you. You keep evaluating their website and make sure that everything is up to snuff. Is that right? Yeah. So, every, every month, because websites are constantly changing, right? They're adding new yeah. ads, new pages. So, we're able to, to um, every month, to produce a new report and it really builds this kind of a trend of compliance so every month you can show how many errors you started with how many were resolved and then going forward it's also a check mark to say you know what you you are compliant we can certify you as compliant and then you're continuing to be compliant and i would imagine that could come in helpful if they do get any pushback um like let's say that they actually have to get legal about something mm -hmm. they could probably produce a report or something that says, look, you know, we did this, this, and this, you're not, you're incorrect there. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we've been in federal court actually three times last year. I was in federal court as mm -hmm. an expert witness for this. And you're, you're hundred percent correct. Having that, that transaction log to show here's what we've been doing for this amount of time. So, you know, in the event that there is a single issue one time, you're not worried about going to court and, and having a, a large lawsuit, right? I mean, it, that's something that we're able to work with, catch it quickly, and then you also have the proof to show, you know, that there's your trend of compliance. You've been working and focusing on this. That's great. Yeah. How did you get into this work? Actually started um, as a consultant back in the late 90s, right when this was coming out. Um, learned about it and one of the large banks I worked for early on, um, they were huge proponents of accessibility. So um, I started working on this really in 03 uh, as a software developer. 